Okay, everyone, I am super excited because I got to get to talk to my pediatric infectious disease legend, hero, Dr. Paul Offit. And I've had the pleasure of talking with him a couple times now about coronavirus, and he was willing and able and had time in his busy schedule to chat again. So, Paul, we are on April 10th. We're a few more weeks into coronavirus than when we last spoke. How are things going in your neck of the woods, and what's the update on coronavirus from your perspective? Well, my neck of the woods in Philadelphia, things are fine. First of all, I remember I work at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Right. This is really not a serious disease in young children. So for us, it hasn't been a big deal at all. Um, HOP, which is the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania that's right next to us, also hasn't been overwhelmed. And, and according to Rachel Levine, who's the um, head of uh, the Department of Health in, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania really has not had a hospital that's been overwhelmed. So for the most okay. part, our region has done okay. We've been able to handle it. Um, I guess my general feeling is, um, here's what I would say. I, I, I apply to the Angela Merkel rule that once you get to a doubling of 10 days, you've mm-hmm. won. You can assume hospital discharge will be greater than hospital admission. So we went from um, 1,000 deaths to 2,000 deaths in two days. We went from 2,000 deaths to 4,000 deaths in four days. We went from 4,000 deaths to 8,500 deaths, also in four days. And now we've gone from 8,500 deaths to almost 17,000 deaths. We weren't quite there last time I looked. It was sort of high 16,000 deaths in five days. So now we're at okay. the five-day period. So the question becomes, then do we, when do we get to 34,000 deaths? I'm going to predict that it's going to be at least five days, probably more like six or seven days. So I think we're definitely getting in the right direction. I think we're flattening the curve. And I, what I think people need to understand is the goal is not to prevent all coronavirus cases and all coronavirus deaths. If that's right. the goal, then we should stay shelter in place and lock down for the next two years, which we can't do because we are about to face the second half of this public health emergency, which is massive joblessness that will lead to massive homelessness and all the attendant consequences of massive homelessness, like food insecurity and domestic violence and child abuse and suicide. Right. That's the second part of this that has to be considered. So what I'm hearing from you is we're expecting, it sounds like the the doubling time is lengthening, which is what we want to see. And we also can't expect that we're going to shut everything down for coronavirus, but we're just trying to lengthen things out so that the hospital systems don't get overwhelmed while we get to that 10 days and beyond of doubling of deaths and cases. Exactly. Okay. And um, what have you seen as far as children go with with, um, coronavirus? Is it, as we had talked about before, where they have less severe disease, um, less hospitalizations, less ICU, less fatality? Um, Has that been the case as we've seen things develop in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I think I haven't seen the most recent data as of, as of uh, this morning, but as far as I understand, there have been fewer than five children who have died, I mean, people less than 18 years of age. And there was a one-year-old, there was a 17-year-old there, right. a child at our hospital who, who may not survive. But um, of the almost 17,000 deaths, I mean, you know, a handful of children have died, which is tragic. But to put that in perspective, more than 150 children have died this year of influenza, which is more willing to kill children than this virus is. Right. And so, I mean, that's something definitely that we can hang our hat on that coronavirus, even though it's serious in the adult population, seems to be less serious uh, and less fatal in children. And of course, those deaths in in children make the news. And then people wonder, well, I thought it wasn't supposed to be as bad. But comparatively, there are few deaths. And we know that some children, um, some there will be some tragic cases just because that's how population epidemiology works. Mm -hmm. What about um, treatments in terms of, is there anything new that we know in adults or children that's working for coronavirus? So, so no, is the short answer. Um, okay. Certainly there are a number of things that are being tried. And I think within the next week or two, you're going to now start to see published studies looking at hydroxychloroquine, plus or minus azithromycin, which, for which I have, frankly, little hope, um, okay. despite uh, Donald Trump's statement that <laughs> it would be the greatest breakthrough in the history of medicine. I think yeah. people would argue about what the greatest breakthrough would be. Agreed. <laughs> so I, I don't have a lot of hope for that. Drugs like remdesivir, which is a protease uh-huh. inhibitor, 
this virus has a protease, um, like HIV has a protease. So we'll see whether that works. Campinavir, okay. uh, and then there's a drug called uh, flavipiravir, which is a, a so-called RNA a dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. So it inhibits really all any sort of RNA virus theoretically in the lab. So we'll see whether that works in people. So I, th I think we actually I'm optimistic that there will be an antiviral in place. Okay. I, I think that, that if we, if we had a vaccine that was a, a safe and showed at least in pre-licensure trials, assuming this ever goes to licensure, it was safe and, and effective. Um, I can't imagine that happened within two years. Uh, it just okay. be remarkably, remarkably. Remember the fastest vaccine ever developed in the history of man. I'm not talking about flu vaccines because we actually make a flu vaccine every year, but that that uh, platform is clearly well in place. Would be the mumps vaccine. I mean, which is okay. to say. You know, the, the person, Maurice Hillman, isolated that virus from his daughter in 1963. That was a commercial product in 1967, four years later. And so it took a long time to get that from t to the population because of all the trials and everything. And then, you know, the approval process and everything. Can you tell us anything about current vaccine trials and, and where we're at with a coronavirus vaccine? Obviously, it's going to take quite a bit of time to get there, but I know that people have been working on it. But what's the update there? Yeah, so, so when Maurice Hillman made a mumps vaccine, by the way, in 1960, in the mid-60s, the, the bar by the FDA was far lower. So as compared to what it is today, the average length of time it takes to make, make a vaccine is about 20 years. In okay. terms of um, so we can update on the vaccines, I think, I think we can make a vaccine. I mean, natural infection with human coronavirus appears to protect against Trump with the same serotype. Uh, the, uh, so that's good. If natural infection can protect, that means that you're likely to be able to make a vaccine that works. We know the protein of interest. It's that spike protein, so-called S protein, which is the cell attachment protein that you okay. see in virtually every media story about this. We've seen sort of the, you know, the virus and little spikes coming out of it. I've seen some great cakes that people have even made with those spikes coming out of them. <laughs> Impressive. So, so, and so then the question is how to do that. And, and so the, uh, Moderna is a company that has a messenger RNA platform where you, you inoculate with the messenger RNA that's then translated to that spike protein and you make an immune response. Novio okay. has a DNA vaccine, same thing. DNA, the codes for that region, the, 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 uh, the, the spike uh, protein region that's then transcribed to messenger RNA that's ran, tran translated to a protein. There are purified protein approaches that a number of companies are using, which is like the hepatitis B or human papillomavirus mm -hmm. vaccine. And then there's a vectored approach like the Ebola vaccine or the dengue vaccine, where you take another virus and then put into it the gene that codes for that protein. So okay. there's, there's probably about 20, 25 companies that are actually looking at moving forward on this. And so We'll see how it plays out. Certainly the government is a tremendous pull mechanism to spend the money to get that done. So we'll see. I'm, I'm optimistic there, there can be a vaccine. I just would be stunned if it was available in two years. And do you think that um, this will be something where it's a annual vaccine? Like, is there as much shift as with flu or is that not going to be the issue? It's going to be a less frequent need for vaccine. But so the, it doesn't seem to mutate, although there are two okay. strains out there, they're the same serotype. So, so I, I okay. don't think it's going to be flu. Um, okay. And then the question becomes, number one, will weather matter? I mean, as it gets mm -hmm. more hot and humid, will that then decrease transmission, which is true of the human coronaviruses? I mean, the four strains of human coronavirus that circulate in our population are winter spring viruses. They're not summer viruses, but this is a bat coronavirus. It's, it's just made right. its debut in the human population. We'll see whether or not that happens here. Does it occur over the summer? Does it come, occur next year? Does occur the year after. We'll see. I, I don't know. I mean, certainly that wasn't the story of the first two novel coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, mm -hmm. which were one year and done. Right. And so hopefully that will be the case with this as well. That it just, I mean, and those didn't make it as around the world in this to the same degree, of course. Um, so Not even um, I mean, SARS was 8,000 cases and, and 800 deaths. MERS was um, 2,500 cases and 1,000 deaths. This virus is far more contagious than that. So are there things that we're, that we're learning from other countries that are uh, farther ahead of us in terms of their peak and leveling off um, that we should be applying to ourselves um, now in the States? Yeah, that's a great question. I think two years from now, we're going to look back on this and figure out the things we should have done and the things we shouldn't have done. Was it mm -hmm. too draconian? Did, did we really need to shut down schools? I mean, could, it, you know, could we have been more surgical or targeted in our approach? I mean, if you look at the, what I would argue, the control group country is Sweden. I mean, Sweden is basically saying, go to school, 
go to work. You know, if you want to congregate in groups of 50 or more, that's fine. But, you know, if you're older, stay home. If you're sick, stay home. If you're around somebody who's sick, stay home. So it's kind of the honor system. Mm -hmm. Um, They have uh, about 750 deaths in a population of 10 million. So that's a a, a population a little more than 30 fold less than ours. We have a 300 Mm -hmm. million population, which would translate to about 25,000 deaths here compared to our 17,000 deaths. So more deaths. I mean, not amazingly more deaths, but you know, more right. deaths that is what you're saying. So I think the shelter, whatever you want to call it, shelter in place lockdown is a value. I do think there probably is, as we'll look back on this and we'll look at states or regions that did things differently, that did or didn't have um, this trans, uh, this, this happen. We'll see. But and also I think what we're about to learn is just how devastating it is to have what is anticipated to be 35 million Americans out of work. I think right. that is going to be the, 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 other side of this. And that's why when we look back on this, we'll see we could have done some things differently, I'm sure. There's there's a lot of long-term consequences that we don't foresee now that will be a result that will affect public health in an even greater way than um, this current coronavirus outbreak is what it sounds like you're saying. Exactly. Yes. With with everything that comes along with homelessness and joblessness and lack of insurance, um, those are all downstream effects. Your food insecurity, I think, you know, domestic violence, which has already clearly gone up, um, you know, right. child abuse, uh, you know, su- depression, suicide. I mean, look at all the people who aren't being hurt in court now who are either victims of domestic abuse or, or child abuse that just aren't getting their day in court. I mean, this is this is tragic at so many levels beyond just, you know, people suffering and dying from this virus. Right. And it's been a huge shock to our system. What about testing? Do you think that um, is testing catching up? with um, what we need in the United States, or are we still at a, way, a ways away from being able to test as many patients as we need to? No, we're still doing this in a very sporadic, haphazard manner. I mean, when you see the number of cases based on testing, you can assume that number is dramatically lower than the actual number. Sure. In, in Italy, actually, when they started to do serological testing, which is the best way to, to answer this, because then you, then you, it's not a matter of sampling error, which can certainly do with the PCR test. I mean, we know that PCR test has really about a 30% false negative rate, meaning when you, when you identify the virus, say, in bronchoalveolar lavage in people who are severely ill, you know, nasopharyngeal suctioning only shows it's positive about 60, 67% of the time. So, you know, that, that's, that's a problem. Um, I think, I think um, where testing will help us in the end, I think, is serological testing, because that, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, if you, you're not going to have a sampling error problem, I think you'll know right. whether you've been exposed to this virus, and you probably can say comfortably you're immune, and therefore that group of people can safely go back to work. That group of people can deliver food to, you know, to, to or deliver comfort in nursing homes, you know, that you know who, the, who that group is. You can create an army of people who've been you know, who've been naturally infected. Interestingly, in Italy, the, it's estimated that the about 38% of the population was affected, infected, which is remarkably high. Right. And, and I would imagine that you could even, well, tell me if I'm wrong, but you know, you do the serological testing, which for those that aren't familiar with that, you take a blood sample, you look for the antibodies to coronavirus in the patient's blood. And then you say, okay, if you have antibodies, then obviously you've been exposed and your immune system has mounted a response against coronavirus, so you must have had it, um, even if you were asymptomatic. Could you foresee that in the future serological testing to you know people that never experience symptoms to have them tested and then decide, okay, do they need the vaccine or can they go work in the hospital wards um, because they have evidence of immunity? Right. I think if you're seropositive, you don't need the vaccine. And okay. if it's true of like the human coronavirus experimental human trials, you're probably um, protected for, for a few years. Not okay. decades, but a few years, which, you know, I think will get you past this virus. What about, so if we can talk more about, you know, treating people with this, um, and especially healthcare workers, um, when do, do we abide by the same rules in terms of the general population when it comes to catching coronavirus going through the disease and then returning to work? Are the guidelines still the same for when we physicians, nurses, other people on the front lines can return to work? Well, it looks like the CDC is starting to loosen that up a little bit and saying that if you're, if you're asymptomatic, um, that you can go to work. I mean, because we're all exposed these days. And so it's, it's, and there's a lot of asymptomatic, and there's a lot of people who are asymptomatic shedders. So there are a lot of people who are being exposed that don't know they're being exposed. And the healthcare system in some areas is getting overrun. So 
Um, we'll see how this plays out. It's, um, it's, it, this, we'll look back on this two years from now and we'll see who the heroes of the story and who the villains of this story are. We just don't know who they are yet. Right. I'm just imagining all the different podcasts and docu-series and everything that are going to come out of what we learn about coronavirus. When do you see, when is the time, what, what will the measures be or what will the metrics be really that tell us that we're, we're at the, the, the end of this? What will that look like in terms of the doubling time or when can we send kids back to school would be another good question. I think when we flatten the curve, when we, because okay. that's the whole point. I mean, you know, flu will kill, you know, the upper estimate right now by the CDC is 65,000 people will die this year from influenza. But the difference is, is that influenza infection started in October and it's sort of been spread out. This virus right. didn't really start to spread in the community until January, somewhere around end of January. And then, then it started to get, so then it was just exploded and there was a surge into the, uh, healthcare community, which scared people that we were not only just not going to be able to take care of these patients, but other patients who required critical care. Um, once we're past that, once the discharges are greater than the emissions, and I think that's actually going to be fairly soon, my prediction is within the next couple of weeks or so. And once we're now down off the curve, we're, you know, we're getting doubling times of eight days, nine days, I think then what we do is we slowly bring ourselves back into, into the workforce, knowing there'll probably be another bump, but that we can handle it. Because the goal, again, is not avoid all cases, avoid all deaths. That's the goal of staying indoors for the next two years. The goal is to be able to handle it. I mean, it's, it's interesting that the, the incidence of influenza has also recently dramatically dropped more so than you would expect at this time of the year. So, right. you know, if that's the goal. If we want to try and prevent the 30 or 40,000 deaths from influenza every year, we should stay home every winter. We don't sure. do that because, you know, we would pay an enormous price, a price we're about to find out about very soon. So once that curve is flattened, then we gradually return, expecting that there will be more cases, um, but our healthcare system will be able to handle it. So that's really, again, just the overall point is allow our healthcare system to be able to handle it so we're not rationing care, we're not running out of medications and ventilators and all of the things that those that are sick with it and really sick with it actually need, while the general population, by and large, makes their way through the disease at some point. Um, over the next year. Exactly. Okay. Now, um, the last question that I have, I'm looking through the list of people. I, I had kind of bragged that I got to talk to you again, so people had sent, gave me questions. What about these younger individuals that have severe disease or die from it? It seems like um, the vast majority of children do fine, but then we have this 20 to 40, 20 to 50 year olds where there are a number of cases where they have severe disease, they have ARDS and um, cytokine storm, what, what do we know about them or what, what's going on there with, with those cases? Right. So again, that, I mean, just because you're, um, you're less than 45 and otherwise healthy doesn't mean you might not uh, get infected with this and, and die from it. It's just much, much less common. So although these patients can be admitted to the ICU and can be intubated and ventilated, they tend to live more than does the older patient who has comorbidities with the comorbidities being primarily type 2 diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. And maybe that's why our country is suffering more, you know, because we have maybe a greater instance of those, those comorbidities than do some other countries. And so if I am a, you know, in that age group, the 20 to 45 age group and relatively healthy otherwise, um, what I think you're saying is I shouldn't worry so much that I, I can't go about my normal life because I see about the 35 year old that died from coronavirus on the news or something like that, that, that in general, the younger age people that have severe disease will overcome it because they don't have other comorbidities or not more, uh, or not older. Right. You should worry about driving to work. That would be a much riskier endeavor than, than well, getting so, coronavirus and dying from it is what you're saying. Well, so about 35,000 people die a year in car accidents. Um, okay. Not, they were at roughly 17,000 so far for COVID-19. We'll see if we get over 35. Probably will, but not probably not all that much over 35,000. We'll see. I'm going to predict we'll probably end up around 60,000. Okay. Well, again, like usual with these, you tend to give me some reassurance and um, hopefully my audience as well. And uh, I would just love to have you back on in another few weeks to talk about this again. But thank you for all that you're doing. Please keep up the great efforts. Um, and please keep us in the loop if there's new things that we learn as we go. My pleasure. Take care, Phil. All right. Thanks, Paul. 